Three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium season two. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This curriculum aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today, we are going to have two great talks on computational fabrication. And our opener, Maria Larson, is going to talk about Zugiti, interactive design and fabrication of wood joints. And Mina Konakovic Lukovic for transforming design and fabrication with computational discovery. And as usual, if you have any questions, please leave comments in the YouTube live chat or our Discord channel. It is my great pleasure to introduce our opener, Maria. She's a PhD student supervised by Professor Takeo Igarashi at the University of Tokyo. And you heard me right, she's currently in Tokyo, which means that it's about 10 p.m. local time. We really appreciate that Maria stayed up so late with us. She has a background in architectural design with several years of working experience as an architect. And her research is also very unique. Instead of working with like traditional materials or the popular 3D printing technology, she focused on developing fabrication systems for the wood material. And today she will be presenting her latest work published at WIST 2020 named Zugiti. Please join me to welcome Maria. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me uh, get started. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Maria. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much for organizing this event. It's I'm very excited and honored to be invited to, to do the opening talk. And um, yeah, the work I will present today is um, Tsugite, Interactive Design and Fabrication of Good Joints. So yeah, this work was done uh, together with Hironori Yoshida, Nobuki Umetami and Takeo Igarashi. And it was presented as, um, like you said, as a technical paper at the UST conference last fall. And um, <clears throat> what we propose is a system to you know, facilitate both the design and the fabrication of uh, wood joints. And first, uh, yeah, let me share a bit um, like, uh, about the background of this work. So wood joint, it's used for both architecture and furniture, both um, like uh, old uh, traditionally and also in kind of recent examples. And uh, wood joints are appreciated both because of uh, their aesthetic qualities and because uh, they are very uh, functional. But it is actually yeah, very difficult to design these kind of joints because uh, the geometries easily get very complicated. And other works um, in kind of computer graphics field uh, has tried to tackle this problem of uh, designing wood joints by um, interactive design. For example, um, this work, um, the user draws like a, a surf curve on the exterior surface and uh, then generates the joints. And here's another example where uh, joints that are interlocking are automatically generated. Uh, these uh, work, they share one limitation, and that is that um, results are typically 3D printed or built from Lego. And in the case when they're actually fabricated from wood, it's made by hand by a professional woodworker. But uh, kind of computational fabrication techniques uh, for manufacturing joints are not uh, considered as integral parts of the systems. So that's what uh, we're trying to do. <laughs> because it's actually very difficult to fabricate joints from wood by hand. It's a skill that uh, yeah, people practice for a long time before uh, they can do it. <laughs> An alternative way to manufacture joints is with the so-called CNC machine. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with CNC machine, it's 
basically you feed x, y, and z coordinates uh, to this machine that moves uh, accordingly. And uh, there's a milling bit that mills, uh, like, yeah, subtracts material. So it's all kind of like the opposite of 3D printing. Instead of adding material, you remove material. Uh, and yeah, in this way, even uh, yeah, less experienced people can make very precise wooden joints. However, it adds some kind of more geometrical requirements of the joints. And uh, there is uh, yeah, some related work that um, focus on um, designing joints that are compatible with CNC fabrication. Uh, this is uh, the most extensive library, I think, of these kind of joints, but it's a library of uh, kind of static 3D models of such joints. But um, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, an interaction, an interactive system for designing CNC compatible joints. And uh, so, uh, the, what you see here is um, kind of animation of how to edit a joint by pushing and pulling on the faces. And uh, as you can see, this action is synchronized. So if you add a voxel somewhere, uh, it's removed somewhere uh, on the corresponding side. And uh, what you also see perhaps is that the design is kind of limited to this uh, voxelized design space. And you can yeah, change, depending on yeah, what you're making, you can change the position of, uh, uh, of the timber. But we only focus on, we don't focus on the global structure in this program, but just on one joint at a time. You can change uh, many parameters, such as the sliding axis, the number of timbers that are involved in the joint, the resolution of the voxels, the angle of the intersection, and the uh, the dimensions, so you don't have necessarily have to have square uh, cross sections. And then, um, while the person, while the user edits the joint, you receive graphical feedback about the performance of the joint. And this is the eight evaluation criteria that we consider. Uh, and I will, yeah, show further two of them: uh, slidability and durability. So. Yeah, slidability, for example, here, it's uh, shown by these arrows at the end of the timber, indicates the active sliding directions. And when a timber is sliding in more than one direction, the outline is uh, made red. So that to give, yeah, give you a hint that you should maybe change the joints so that only slides in one direction, which is usually preferable. Another metric is durability. And here we look for voxels that are sticking out perpendicular to the grain orientation of the wood, because grain is strong, uh, wood is strong in the fiber direction, but much weaker in non-fiber direction. So these kind of parts, they tend to uh, break off, like as shown in this example here. So this is a very um, simple, uh, but effective way to estimate the uh, feasibility of the joint. Um, the user is also supported with suggestions. So if um, a joint is invalid, that is to say it fails to meet these uh, evaluation criteria that we set up, then uh, the program searches for a valid joint within one edit distance and shows up to four. And there's also a gallery mode of uh, the interface. And here um, we show like pre-calculated valid joints that are made by a combinatorial search uh, in this voxelized space. And then when you have finalized uh, your design, uh, you can directly export the milling path for fabrication. So what you see here uh, is the path that the tool head will follow to cut out the joint, basically the, the negative space of the joint. And um, now I will talk a little bit more in detail about the fabrication. And uh, yeah, one important restriction is that uh, we focus on a three axis CNC machine because yeah, this machine is uh, very like more, yeah, rather affordable and commonly available compared to 
four or more access CNC machines. And the specific constraints of this machine is that um, one is the inner corner constraint and the other one we refer to as the direction constraint. So first of all, this inner corner constraint, it means that you cannot cut uh, sharp inner corners like this that are aligned with the milling bit. They will have a rounded fillet with the same radius as the milling bit that you're using. And this is very important for joints because one side needs to be the kind of opposite, uh, the mirror image of the other side. Uh, and if I design a geometry that has these sharp inner corners here and then fabricate it without any, like just in a normal way, uh, with a normal uh, tool path planning algorithm, then these corners will be rounded, but the corresponding corners will be sharp. So I, I will not be able to assemble my joint. So what our kind of uh, tool path generation algorithm does is that it checks uh, for these corners and then rounds the corresponding outer corners when they're located on inner corners so that you can assemble the joint. And here's a real example of this. So these four outer corners are rounded to match uh, these four inevitably rounded inner corners. And here is another example of the same thing, but a little bit more uh, yeah, advanced version because uh, yeah, these and this, these are two different joints, but this and this timber, they have the same geometry. But actually the corners are rounded differently, as you can see, because they're, they're in the mating timbers have different locations of inner corners. And the second um, constraint is the direction constraint. So here it basically means you can approach the material from above, but you cannot cut somewhere uh, where the axis is blocked. And this gives that every fabricatable geometry can be, be expressed as a height field. So uh, this is something that we use uh, to make the data structure or the, yeah, more uh, efficient. And finally, yeah, let me show some fabricated joints. So this is a, a kind of eye joint in the non-axial sliding direction and uh, with a rather high friction. And this uh, is a joint with uh, three timbers. And uh, I think this one was made with uh, by choosing a joint in the gallery because it's kind of difficult to find the valid joint uh, for three timber connection. And here is a non-orthogonal joint. So it's like an arbitrary angle of intersection. And uh, this is uh, a table uh, with diagonal braces for stability to show, um, yeah, that you can, uh, yeah, what kind of one application of this system to make something useful. So in summary, what are the contributions of CPT? So voxelized joints in themselves are not new. That's what uh, also other people used, for example, uh, the work on interlocking joinery. But what we do is to add some practical constraint to be able to um, fabricate feasible joints out of solid wood with the CNC. So yeah, which basically makes uh, it more useful. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is that, um, uh, yeah, with our system, you can, uh, we provide user editing with real time feedback and suggestions. So yeah, the, the science space is somewhat limited, but uh, with this voxelized space, but as a, uh, but it's very efficient to do computations. So that's why we can provide this interactive speed. As for limitations and future work, there is yeah further potential to increase the design space. For example, we cannot make uh, this popular dovetail joint or some more freeform shapes in the current implementation. Uh, and there's also possibility to add even more evaluation criteria. 
for example, to do finite element analysis for more detailed structural analysis uh, of the joint without uh, the challenge here is yeah, to kind of uh, that the calculation time might be uh, long, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if it can calculate that quickly, that would be very useful. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, I would just, uh, yeah, like to show this kind of illustration of a traditional joint on the right and the Tsugiti joint on the left to show that, um, yeah, there's still a lot of potential to explore more geometries. And uh, I think what we have achieved with Tsugiti is, uh, is uh, yeah, maybe a small step <laughs> towards um, being able to create, uh, yeah, something more uh, like traditional joints. Um, so yeah, that's uh, all from me today. Uh, and, and yeah, please visit the, the project website. We have a lot more materials and yeah, please read the paper if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the interesting and, and great talk. And as usual, we will proceed to the talk of our headliner and have a joint Q&A at the end. So it is my great honor to introduce our headliner, Mina Konakovich Lukovic. She is currently a postdoc at MIT, supervised by Professor Wojciech Matuzik. And before that, she obtained her PhD at EPFL with Professor Mark Pauling. And her research applies beautiful ideas from discrete differential geometry to the problems in digital fabrication. And specifically, she tackles a lot of interesting design problems related to the oxectic material. In addition to fabricating beautiful structures, she further demonstrated the application of such materials in the field of robotics and bioengineering. And she's also the recipient of many, many awards, such as the Siam Activity Group on Geometric Design Early Career Prize and the Schmidt Science Fellowship. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Mina for her talk on computational fabrication. Hey, um, thanks Derek for the awesome introduction. Let me quickly share my screen now. And just give me a heads up if you cannot see it. Okay, so today I will use the opportunity to talk about some of my uh, recent and some of my not so recent work. Um, and they all sum up together in this title that is transforming design and fabrication with computational discovery. So we use computational methods and algorithms to make better practices for design and fabrication. And design is everywhere, behind everything we need to create, no matter if it's a physical or a virtual object. We need to design buildings, art pieces, we need to design engines, machines, and products. In chemistry, we design new molecules, we design chemical ingredients, drugs, and so on. And in computer science, we design abstract forms, for example, neural network architectures, data structures, programming languages, et cetera. But the problem with all these designs is that they're still mostly done manually. They're mo manually created. And what do I mean by manually? We start by designing an object, sketching it or recording it in some form. Then we have to build it in real or virtual world. And only the, after that, we can test or retrieve the, the performance of the designed object. If we are not satisfied with what we obtained, we need to go back to the beginning, iterate, uh, change our design, iterate until uh, we are happy with the, the outcome. So we can end up doing a lot of trial and error before we get the, the final solution. And the problem with this is that it's slow. It uses excessive resources and often requires an expert knowledge and intuition on how things will work. So in today's talk, I will discuss how we can transform this with computational design. Now, what you see now is what you already saw is this so-called forward design where you first design something and then you retrieve the performance. And the performance can be either whether the shape is right, whether the dynamics are good, or maybe how good is the mechanical performance of the object. But wouldn't it be better if we could take as an input the performance requirements and get the optimal parameters for the design generated automatically? 
And that's exactly what inverse design does. Uh, it's another great advantage of computational design. And obviously this needs to be done with algorithms. It cannot be done manually. And that's exactly what my research focuses on, on this automated, automated design with, with the inverse problems. Throughout this talk, I will show you three different projects. Uh, in my PhD work, I mostly focused on problems with geometry processing. We used uh, the insights from discrete differential geometry to enable computational design and fabrication. But after that, when I moved to, to do a postdoc at MIT, I started cheating on geometry with some machine learning algorithms where we use deep learning to design uh, terrain optimized robots and we use data efficient machine learning to uh, automate the process of optimal experiment design. Without further ado, um, let me start. And because this is a geometry processing colloquia, I will spend more time on the first project and a bit less time on the last two. So first project is about designing oxidic structures. Now, first of all, what are oxidic materials? They are these engineered materials that have the unintuitive behavior. When the material is stretched in one direction, it also expands in all other directions. And they appear in many different forms like this three-dimensional foam or a triangular linkage. They are also used in automotive industry for electronically actuated devices, art, fashion, and so on. But the problem with all these things we've seen before is that they're all limited to very simple geometries. They are either planar, spherical, or cylindrical, but not much more than that. So our question in this project was, can we approximate more complex surfaces with oxidic sheet? And that's exactly what the inverse design does. Can we create an inverse design algorithm that will find the right configuration of the material to achieve the given shape? To answer this question, we first started by looking into the, uh, how to create the oxidic sheet. In, if we take a sheet of flexible but inextensible material like this thin acrylic, it can bend freely, so it's developable, but it cannot approximate even simple shapes such as a sphere because sphere is doubly curved. It curves in two directions at every point on the surface. And that's because there is no stretching in the material. It's, it's inextensible. But if we insert a regular pattern of slits in the very same, um, in the very same material, it turns an uh, inextensible material into uniform oxidic. And now the material can stretch, wrap around the sphere and approximate uh, more freeform shapes. But the problem that we are facing now is that if we take a piece of this oxidic material and just try to wrap it around a complex target surface like this head of Max Planck, in most cases it will fail. Because there is a global coupling happening in, in this triangular language, uh, if you stretch the material on one side, you don't know how it will deform on the other side. It will affect the other side of the material as well. And also it's not intuitive how to even align it with the features of the surface. So we had to look into material deformation more closely. And first, we noticed that we can abstract this pattern in the form of a kinematic linkage called, called Kagomi lattice that is composed of equilateral triangles. And what we noticed is that the material scales approximately isotropically. And this observation immediately provided a direct link to conformal geometry. And just to give you a brief overview of what the conformal geometry is, it's a transformation that allows local rotation and uniform scaling, but not shearing. In other words, conformal mapping preserves angles, but not lengths. And we can characterize a conformal map with a local scaling factor. In, for example, in this transformation on the right, uh, you can see that the mapped squares from 2D to 3D preserve their 90 degree angles everywhere, just the edge lengths have scaled in uh, scaled across the surface. And again, we want to be able to do things that are curved, but not only simply curved things like the zero Gaussian curvature that are done for developable surfaces where you can only bend in one direction. We want to do things that have Gaussian curvature being negative or positive or having a doubly curved surface. 
Now, our goal is to establish a relationship between the local stretching of the material and the curvature of the surface we can approximate. And for this, we can use the Yamada equation that relates the local change in Gaussian curvature and the variation uh, in conformal scale factor. And this essentially tells us how, how much variation in stretching we need to introduce in the material in order to achieve the, the certain curvature that appears in the surface. And while this, equ this equation has been studied for, uh, for a while, for a long time, what people did not study so much is the fact that in our physical material, the scaling factor is actually bounded. We cannot stretch the material arbitrarily. And once uh, the material is fully stretched, it expands four times in area or two times in length. So this limits the scaling factor uh, to be between one and two. Now, what this means in practice is that um, if we take a simply connected domain, for example, like this face of Max Planck, a Riemannian theorem guarantees that there is a conformal map to the plane of this surface. But the theorem assumes that we can have unlimited scaling. And in fact, for this particular example, the scaling around the nose uh, is of a factor 59, which is much higher than what we achieve. And that's because there is a lot of change in curvature around the nose. So in order to push it to the plane, it has to have a lot of distortion or this uh, large scale factor. And to solve that problem and to make it actually realizable with our material, we have to use uh, so-called cone singularities. Uh, so that the idea is basically you find the point on the surface that has the largest um, uh, the largest curvature, you, you introduce a cone singularity there and you cut out the surface uh, towards the boundary. And now you, you can push all that curvature, all the distortion can be distributed uh, along the boundary. So there's much more, um, much more space for this distortion to, to be reduced. And in this example here, just with a single cone singularity, we were able to reduce the scale factor from 59 to go below two. And that's what we needed. But another uh, thing to note here is that this opening angle is not random. It's actually uh, designed or it's, it's used quantized cone angles with the prescribed angles uh, to match the kind of cutouts we can have in our material. So that's the two pi over three. And actually we can use quantized cone angles that are just an integer multiple of two pi over three. And this was fundamental because otherwise we could not realize the surfaces with our physical requirements. Now, our final algorithm looks as follows. We first find the location of these cone singularities we need and we compute the conformal map. Then we can overlay a grid of regular triangles over the 2D domain to determine the 2D layout of the material and the local stretching we need in 3D. And then we run a 3D optimization to lay out our auxetic linkage onto the target surface. And if, uh, uh, effectively what we are doing here is we are running a global optimization which pushes the linkage close to the reference surface. It makes sure that the triangles remain rigid because that's the physical reality and avoid collision between the neighboring triangles. And we can nicely formulate all these geometric constraints in the form of distances between the vertices of the triangles and use a nonlinear solver to obtain the final solution. And because the problem is nonlinear, you may think that maybe just this uh, simple equation with three constraints would be enough to get the final shape, but that's not what happens. It's actually this example that we design in this way just by using these three constraints. But because it's a nonlinear problem, we can easily get stuck in local minima. So conformal mapping, it was essential for solving a problem like this. And this is the final approximation. So you can see the variable openings in the material depending on how the surface is, is, is curving. So you can have more closed regions, more open regions like on the chin or the nose and the forehead and so on. Uh, just a quick example, one more example here on how we approximate a surface. So this is a famous cat head. And here we needed to use three cone singularities in order to reduce the scale factor to be below two. And again, these all three uh, singularities are quantized. Um, and it's important to note here that as a designer, 
the 2D layout is totally unintuitive. You wouldn't really guess that you need a layout like this in order to make a head of a cat. So the algorithm was really essential in, in improving the what kind of shapes we can make with this material. Now to verify our approach, we fabricated the mask example with the copper sheet. So the copper sheet is etched to have the openings that we need. And this is the final result uh, followed uh, that is a product of our algorithm and it's uh, actual uh, physical artifact. And because we use this global optimi uh, optimization approach, um, we obtain the approximation without visible seams. So you cannot find where we cut the surface and then, uh, uh, and then close it up um, to, to have the final solution. Another example is this high heel shoe made from aluminum uh, oxidic sheet. And again, it's really not intuitive that you need this 2D layout to, to approximate the target shape. And here is the video footage of the fabricated prototype. Again, you cannot detect the seam where the 2D patch is connected together to form the closed loop. And nowadays, this pattern and this material started pop popping out everywhere. You can see it in architectural structures, in, in sport shoes, in sport clothing, wearables, even in personalized orthopedic casts. And I'm very excited to see what kind of applications we'll enable next in the future. And another thing that I haven't emphasized so far is that this material can be used to generate transformative structures. With the same piece of exotic material, we can approximate different geometries, like these two different faces. And while this can be beneficial for some applications, it also makes the fabrication tedious because we have to achieve the exact opening angles between the triangles computed by the algorithm in, uh, in order to reach the, the target surface. This inspired our next research question, actually. So our next research question was, can we program the 2D material to be able to approximate exactly one 3D shape once deployed? And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we designed programmable auxetics. In comparison to uniform auxetics that have identical triangles and variable openings in the surface, the programmable auxetics are fully open everywhere, but vary the scales of the triangles. And this way we can simply take the material, stretch it out everywhere to the maximum and achieve the encoded shape. In, in the programmable auxetics, we encode the maximal local stretching that the material can have. And in the regions with, uh, for example, for this half sphere in the regions where we have triangles that are, very, uh, that are small and that are already open in the 2D configuration, there cannot be much more stretching. But in, for example, the central region where the triangles are large and they're in the closed configuration, you can already imagine that you can push them out of, of, the, out of the plane and, and scale uh, quite, quite a bit. So there's more, more scaling that the material can have in the, uh, in the central part. And again, to determine the local uh, stretching that we need to uh, need, depending on the surface, we can use the Yamabe equation and the conformal map. In this case, the optimization pipeline is a little different than before. And I'm happy to discuss the details offline or feel free to shoot me an email. But in the interest of time, I will move on to tell you a little bit about the deployment mechanism or how, uh, how we transform the material from, from the flat state to the target shape. We observed that both inflation and gravity can work as mechanisms that can stretch the material, but not any shape can be made with these, uh, with these mechanisms. And that's where the interesting geometry comes in. Namely, if we think of inflation as a volume maximizing action, and we look at this example of a ball with an inward bump. If we continue to pump the air inside of this ball, the bump is simply going to pop out. Uh, we are filling more air volume inside, uh, inside the, of the ball and there is nothing to keep the bump in. So we observe that this phenomena can nicely be captured with a differential geometry concept of mean curvature. And for those of you who are not that familiar with mean curvature, it's just a measure of the divergence of the surf unit surface normals. 
So inside of this inward bump, the normals are pointing toward, towards each other, so resulting in a negative divergence. And while on the outward bump, the normals are pointing away from each other and having the positive divergence everywhere. And inspired by this observation, we were able to introduce and, and prove a theorem that essentially says, if you have a surface of a limited area and a maximized enclosed volume, the surface has to have positive mean curvature everywhere. Now, this is great because it can immediately inform our algorithm and what kind of shapes we can realize. So if the user provides a target shape that is physically unrealizable, we can automatically detect the problematic region and edit, uh, and edit it towards the closest realizable shape. So no need for the user to manually go back and forth with the design until she finds uh, the version of the shape that can actually be inflated. Okay, now let's see this in action. Um, for a target shape like this one, we compute the optimized programmable oxidic linkage in both 3D and 2D. And we laser cut the linkage, we attach it on the, uh, we lift it with a generic rubber, rubber balloon that has no information of the target shape and the linkage will then stop the inflation once it's fully stretched everywhere. And it will go to the prescribed shape. So with this, we can now have architectural domes that are inflated that are much more uh, interesting and nicer than the usual ones that we see around for tennis courts and football courts and so on. Um, and we can also use this technology to make a Mars habitat because the Mars pressure is 10 times lower than on Earth, the habitat needs to be pressurized. And we can conveniently pack the flat sheet of material in a box, then ship it to Mars and simply inflate it on site without any additional construction material or scaffolds uh, uh, and so on. Another interesting application may be found in heart stents that are inserted in the heart uh, to unclog blood vessels. Typically, they are made regular and straight. However, a study from 2016 argues that this is problematic for patients with clogged vessels that are curved. They propose how to make a curved balloon that expands the stent, but they do not have a solution for the metal part that stays in the vessel. And with our method, we can now scan the patient's heart, detect the clogged vessel, reconstruct the 3D model, and design the stent optimized exactly for that patient. And before I mentioned that we can also deploy things with gravity, um, the theory is pretty much the same. We still need positive mean curvature everywhere, but we can only do surfaces that are height fields. That's the only difference. Now, without much technical details here, I will just show you an example of it. So we take a target surface like this and know that in the middle part, it has this saddle point that's a negative Gaussian curvature, but still positive mean curvature. Um, we find the optimized deployed state, uh, we find the optimized flat state, and then the only thing we need to do is just simply hang the material and it will go to the, to the target shape that we wanted. So it has this middle region that is really non-intuitive, this saddle point, but because of our alg uh, optimization algorithm, we were able to make sure that once deployed, it's going to stay there. And it's always nice to see your research used in actual products. Um, a gravity deployed shading pavilion uh, designed with our technology will soon be built at EPFL campus next to the famous Rolex Learning Center. Um, and now I hope I, I um, showed um, how geometry processing can be essential for designing and, and making some impossible designs um, that uh, have actual applications in real life. And now let's switch um, to the second project with deep learning, where we were um, looking into designing terrain optimized robots. Today, most of the robots are designed manually for a target purpose. So many of us have seen videos of robots that are designed for specific terrains, whether it's uh, flat ground, natural environment, climbing buildings, and, and so on. But in each case, we can see that the structure of a robot defines which tasks it can perform. And this design direction is manual. But 
automatically designing robots would require solving an inverse design problem where we go from a set of desired capabilities to the robot structures. And our recent work presents a workflow for uh, automatic design of co-optimized robots and controllers for a given terrain. And everything is automatically done, no need for human input here. And while we are proposing a solution for terrain optimized robots, this can be easily generalized to other robot design problems. And the workflow starts as follows. First, the user has to provide a set of input components she wishes to use and the desired terrain that the robot should be able to traverse. The terrains can be challenging, non-repetitive, asymmetric with unevenly steps, uh, step terrains, uh, wall obstacles, uh, gaps, ridges, and so on. And regarding the input components, the user provides the set of links, joints, and end structures and their properties she wishes to use for the robot assembly. Now, if we would manually try to check all possible configurations, and keep in mind that the configurations may easily include 50 different components. This, this could take a lifetime. Um, not, not to mention that many of these configurations we, we could not even fabricate and they wouldn't be able to walk. If you connect a knee joint next to the uh, wheel in the middle of the structure, it doesn't make any sense. So what, what should we do? How, how can we automate the design process and which arrangements should be allowed? To answer this question, we used grammars. We borrow this theory from natural language processing community, and more specifically, we work with graph grammars. First of all, we abstract the structure of a robot in the form of a graph, where each node represent, uh, represents a robot part, such as body links, uh, joints, um, and uh, limb components. And to enforce the symmetry in parts of, of limbs, we simply copy one limb branch into the other side of the body. This uh, directed graph can then easily be turned into a kinematic tree for simulation. And what is a graph grammar? It consists of a set of symbols and a set of derivation rules. And these symbols represent abstract concepts such as robot head, tail, um, body, and so on. And a grammar always contains a start symbol from which the derivation is to, to begin. Each rule consists of a left-hand side and the right-hand side. And applying a rule to a, a graph means replacing an instance on the left-hand side in that graph with the right-hand side of the rule. And these rules make sure that only allowed and fabricable arrangements, uh, from, uh, fabricable arrangements of robots uh, will be made. And to generate a robot design from the grammar, we start from an initial graph consisting of just the start symbol. We then apply a sequence of rules by taking, identifying the left-hand side, then replacing it with the right-hand side of the rule, then the next rule uh, looks for the left-hand side and then again replaces, with, replaces it with the right-hand side of the rule and so on. And a simple example of this, how we generate a robot with the grammar rules is here. Um, we start from the start symbol, we then apply a sequence of rules that will keep on adding more and more robot parts until we reach some stopping criteria. Finally, our complete bio-inspired grammar looks like this. We have structural rules that form the body structure and the part-based rules that select the components. And this slide is cluttered, but the, the message that I want to convey here is that uh, with just 23 different rules, with just this simple set of rules, we can generate hundreds of thousands of different designs. So they all fit in a single slide, all the rules that we need to generate so many designs. And all of these designs will be inspired by animals and all able to walk. And here we can see some example structures of what our grammar can automatically generate. Uh, but these are still not optimized for a given set of terrains. We need an algorithmic solution to identify the best ones. And the brute, brute force here just simply will take too long. What do I mean by, by non-optimized? So here is a simulated robot uh, with a non-optimal structures. It's trying to clear the ridges but it has extra long, uh, um, extra long limbs and it's not the most optimal for crossing them. 
And then another example uh, is this one with wheels that has an added mechanism for climbing, but would be much better going down, downhill than climbing stairs. So we obviously need a way to find more optimal designs. And to do this, we develop a deep learning based approach that learns heuristics in simulation to not simulate and test uh, hundreds of thousands of designs, but quickly discover structures that work best for a given terrain. Just to give you a, a, a heads up for the simulation part, this is not our major contribution because we used a popular approach called model predictive control. So I'm not going to spend much time explaining on how it actually works. I just want to mention that we compute the performance of the robot and, and get the optimal controllers with the reward function that makes sure that the robot is facing forward, staying upright and uh, walking as fast as possible. Okay, so now uh, about our selection strategy or the strategy for finding the optimal designs. To identify the best solutions, uh, we do the following. We can think of the design space defined by the grammar as a search tree with the star symbol at the root and each branch generates a robot by following the sequence of rules that are stored in the edges of this tree. And once we have a complete robot design, we can simulate it and compute its performance. In this example, we would be looking for the branch on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, as it has the highest performance value, but deriving every single branch all the way to the end and simulating every robot for thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of different designs is intractable. And we need a way to estimate uh, some values for incomplete designs early on, uh, represented with these, with these dash nodes in the tree. We want to be able to predict what is the best performance going to be lower down in the branch. So here, an example that is showing on the left, for example, because the robot has 3.1 performance, uh, that performance is going to best in the uh, in the leaves of the tree. So we we put it up in the in the branch, and we figure that this branch is more promising than the others. And to come up with the predict prediction scheme that uh, uh, what kind of which branches will be more promising, we develop a method called graph heuristic search. Our method is inspired by the well known A star search, but instead of manually designing the heuristics, we learn the heuristics with the graph neural network. We learn an approximation of the reward function V by using the simulated values of several designs to train a graph neural network. And after training the GNN model, we can use it to predict the maximal rewards for each branch uh, early on and see which are the promising branches to explore further and which to immediately abandon. And after training the heuristic function, the process repeats for a fixed number of iterations and gradually converges to the optimal design. And here are some results. Um, this robot uses its highly articulated front limbs and the front body joint that allows for lifting the front body part to clear the ridges. The optimized robots in here can rapidly change direction by swinging its head and pivoting around its front legs to efficiently avoid a series of walls. And this completely unintuitive structure proves to be better performing than uh, all other designs. And unevenly, unevenly stepped terrain is one of the more challenging terrains uh, for robots. And the optimized robot has these front hooks for climbing and simple back legs to save energy. So using the theory from natural language processing and developing a new deep learning algorithm were the key in, in automatic design of uh, terrain optimized robots. And more importantly, the same strategy can now be used for designing other types of task uh, optimized robots. And finally, while the last project is also data driven, it is completely different than the deep learning approach. In deep learning, we can have thousands of tra uh, training samples, but uh, in the third project, we have to work with a really with a severely limited resources. So we can have 
around 100 data points to train a machine learning algorithm. And the whole idea started in the project for autonomous discovery of optimal material formulations. We had a set of input chemical ingredients that we could mix in a different ratio to get a material formulation. And we then uh, need to fabricate a material sample with, for example, 3D printing and extract the mechanical performance of the new material with compression testing. And because the mixing, the fabrication and the testing processes are very slow, we could only process four samples per day. We were looking for some way of cleverly selecting which samples to test rather than doing it randomly. And we had zero intuition with how they will perform. And for this, we needed an optimization algorithm to guide the whole development. So the general setup for our algorithm is the following. We have a D-dimensional design space and M-dimensional performance space. And because we have multiple performance metrics, we need to solve a multi-objective optimization problem. In multi-objective optimization, objectives are often conflicting. So there is no single optimal so solution, but rather a set of optimal uh, designs that, with the different trade-offs. And we call this designs Pareto set and its image in the performance space Pareto front. And the goal is to find the Pareto optimal design. Well, uh, the algorithm uh, needs to take of two key challenges. The first one is that the objectives are black box functions. So the mapping between the design and the performance space is unknown, but we can retrieve the values at certain locations by fabricating the sample, testing its performance, and then putting it uh, back to the algorithm. And second, the testing time is resource and time expensive. So the number of experiments that data points uh, and data points is severely limited. Not like in many other machine learning applications where you can have thousands of training samples at hand, uh, you, you really have to be careful on which ones you choose. So this means that we have to choose wisely which samples to evaluate. And the problem set up like this can be found in many applications, in, in molecule and drug design, um, even in vaccine design that we are all very excited about nowadays, in engineering design, material science, uh, developing trading strategies, um, optimizing robot controllers, tuning hyperparameters for neural networks, and, and so on. So how do we solve this problem? The answer can be found in multi-objective Bayesian optimization. We develop an algorithm that uses a standard Bayesian optimization pipeline, but with several improvements to the, to the components. First, we fit the Gaussian process on the set of input observations for each objective independently. We then extract the approximations of the objectives by simply taking the means of the fitted Gaussian processes. And then we search for the Pareto set and front of these objective approximation functions. And from the, that Pareto front, we select a batch of points to evaluate next. And we iterate through all the steps until some stopping criteria is met. The first two steps are commonly used in other Bayesian optimization methods. Our main contribution lies in the last two steps of the pipeline. And while other methods typically obtain a discrete and sparse approximation of the Pareto front, we use the so-called KKT conditions that once we find a single point on the Pareto front, they let us quickly discover large and continuous regions of Pareto optimal so solutions around them and the corresponding Pareto set. And then a key insight for our selection strategy is that these solutions are often grouped in, I'm sorry, in disconnected regions. So we define a diversity metric to encourage sampling from various regions of the space, while also trying to maximize the hypervolume improvement. The, the hypervolume improvement is a standard quality measure of the obtained Pareto front. But in contrast to previous works, our diversity metric takes the knowledge from both the design and the performance space to better select the batch of next ex experiments. And to illustrate the advantage of our solver, and selection strategy here, we show a performance based comparison of a standard test function against other popular and state of the art methods. And you can see that thanks to our um, selection and, and solver strategy, 
we are able to quickly reach the ground through Pareto front and don't get stuck in, in local minima, so much more uh, efficiently than other methods. We performed extensive evaluations on synthetic test functions and monitor, again, the hypervolume improvement. And our algorithm, shown in purple, consistently outperforms all other methods. We also ran tests on the real world data sets. And again, our method achieves better results. And as I mentioned, because this uh, problem appears in many different applications and fields, um, and the problem with current optimal experiment design is that it's mostly done by hand and based on intuition. We wanted to design uh, to develop an open source platform that will help other researchers and engineers um, in many different disciplines. So this platform is made easy to use for users with zero or little experience with optimization and machine learning. And it has a built-in visualization, a distributed version for teams of workers that can operate in parallel, even from remote locations, which is very convenient for uh, the pandemic era. And scientists or technicians can see the values proposed by the algorithm, or what to test next, evaluate them, and finally enter them back to the, um, to the algorithm, uh, to the system. And then the whole process can also be completely automated, where the platform would be integrated as a kind of a brain uh, in the system that automatically generates and tests samples that are requested. And this work is currently in submission to Journal of Machine Learning Research, but we already started collaborating on projects for um, 3D material printing, as I mentioned, acoustics filter, battery design, robot optimization, and so on. And we hope that our work will uh, help bridge the interdisciplinary gap and, and find applications in many more problems. <clears throat> Um, at first glance, all these projects seem totally different. They solve um, different problems and use completely different techniques. Um, but the overarching idea is that we need computation in order to advance um, the, the design and fabrication practices. And this will accelerate the whole development and, and let us do a designs not possible before. So in, in conclusion or summary, um, I would like to mention that in the first project where the geometry processing was uh, the, the, the core, um, we used the insights from conformal geometry to uh, initialize our designs and understand the exotic behavior. We uh, used the global geometric optimization to, to have consistency over the pattern everywhere. And we had this idea with positive mean curvature to discover exactly what are the kind of surfaces we can realize with the deployment mechanism. In the second project, uh, graph grammars were key for uh, generating all possible designs um, automatically. Um, we use the MPC simulation um, uh, to, to get the performance of the robot rather quickly. And we developed a new deep learning uh, algorithm that uh, called graph heuristic search that can efficiently search through large graphs uh, to find uh, optimal designs. In the last project, we used a Bayesian optimization um, kind of approach. We developed a new algorithm with the state-of-the-art performance. And because we use these KKT conditions to quickly discover large and continuous regions of optimal designs, and we had a new diversity-guided selection strategy to wisely pick what are the samples to test next. And finally, before I uh, wrap up, I would uh, also like to uh, mention that none of this work would be possible without uh, the support from great people. So a huge thank you for all my mentor, to all my mentors, collaborators, lab mates, fellows, and so on. And of course, the funding agencies that make this possible. And I would like to open it up for questions now. Thank you both for the great talk. And it is great to see that we have started to pre prepare our future lives on Mars. <laughs> and so we still have some time left. So we will now have a, a start joint Q and a session. And if, um, if you still have questions afterwards, um, please feel free to use our Discord channel for offline discussion. So first is a question for Maria. Um, okay. Does this uh, joint design tool visualization takes in into account the fabrication force that would keep the joint stable? 
basically whether this tool uh, consider the fact of fric friction um, between other joints. Yeah, so um, that's one of the evaluation metrics, uh, but the, actually the, the friction force is very difficult to evaluate because it depends on the very small like material properties of the surface, which can actually, if I just change uh, to an old milling bit or a new milling bit, it's gonna be slightly different because the texture is gonna be slightly different. So instead of that, we, we we just measured the friction area. Uh, and this is a very, very quick to calculate and kind of, uh, uh, yeah, and universal. Uh, yeah, so, so yes, uh, we, not, not the friction force, but the friction area, which should be pro proportional to the friction force is uh, one of the evaluation metrics. Understood, thank you for the answer. And the next question is for Mina. So how hard it is to form the final prototype from the like a 2D sheet with cuts in, in your developable like oxidic materials? Uh, yeah, it depends whether you use the uniform oxidic or the programmable oxidic. With the programmable oxidic, that's why we uh, actually decided to design something like that. It's uh, automatic. So you just let the inflation or gravity do itself. But with the uniform oxidics, uh, Again, it depends on which base material you use. So if you use metal or something with the plastic behavior, um, you have to open it up everywhere manually. Uh, we haven't came up where, uh, well, you could um, potentially have uh, disconnected triangles that are connected with joints that are maybe motor powered. So the motors would know exactly how much to open triangles. So that will be super fast and, and again, automatic. But otherwise, for the mask example and the shoe example, I had to spend many hours opening the triangles exactly how the algorithm computed. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then the metal stays in the right position. But you can also find in our paper an example with the leather piece where uh, the leather has this um, elastic behavior. So you stretch it out, but if you let it go, it will just collapse back. But if you wear it on yourself or you put it on a, on a doll or something like that, it will stay in the right position. So there is no uh, extra effort on, on getting the final shape. I see. Uh, a small quick follow-up on that question is that uh, because on the uniform oxide, you need to kind of cut the shape in order to uh, ensure that the conformal scaling vector is bounded. Uh, yeah. Do you need to ensure like consistency along the boundary, uh, basically the, the consistency of the triangulation along the boundary so that you can potentially stitch them together when you want to uh, inflate it to, to 3D? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And that's exactly what we do with these quantized cone angles. Um, we cannot have any kind of cone singularities or the uh, cone angle uh, because it wouldn't align with the triangles. And because we have these quantized cone angles that allow only a multiple of pi over two pi over three, so you always have an even number of triangles. And the connectivity in the oxidic material is such that if you have an even number of triangles, you can always connect them together. So you can have four triangles connecting and preserving the topology everywhere else. You can have six, you can have eight, and so on. But you cannot have five, for example, the five triangles will uh, uh, will uh, not preserve the topology elsewhere in the material. That's so that's why really using these quantized cone angles is the key in, in figuring out how to do a seamless alignment. I see. Thank you for the answer. And the next question is for Maria. So uh, could the coarse voxel designs uh, be relaxed into like smoother designs, maybe like through some continuous optimization? Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, I think that's a nice. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> I think actually something. Yeah, the the CNC machine is good at cutting like uh, curved shapes. It's uh, when you cut by hand uh, with a chisel, like straight shapes are easier. So kind of with CNC, it's uh, yeah, it's possible to cut curves. So that would be very natural. So. Yeah, I think that's a nice, uh, that's a nice future work. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And the next question is for Nina. It, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's in, on the oxidated materials. So is the surface uh, prone, created by uh, your method prone to ripping? Uh, 
because like is there a like a reaping and oxectic trade-off where the larger triangles uh, are, are stronger and but less they can expand uh yeah um so the way we create oxidic materials is we leave this small hinge between the triangles so we can laser cut them and depending on the size and even the shape of the hinge you determine what is the how how fast it will break and again it also depends on the material base material properties whether what's the thickness of the metal or or the leather or the paper uh, whatever you're using and luckily this uh, research is uh, this is studied by um, other uh, researchers in other disciplines like mechanical engineering and they do a lot of tests on uh, on how much uh, you can stretch it out and how what kind of these uh, connections to leave and what are best for different types of materials um, but again if you do something large scale like our gravity example you can use joints to connect disconnected triangles um, and depending on the quality of joints, it will, um, it will probably not break if you do it uh, well enough. And I mean, it's also going to be built uh, on the architectural scale. So I guess the structural engineers uh, figured it out how to do it to not break <laughs> under wind and, and snow and other, um, other weather conditions. I see. Thank you for the answer. So we are over time. So thank you everyone for joining this colloquium and let's thank our speakers again. And if you still have questions, please use our Discord for offline discussion. I believe the, the speakers will be happy to answer your questions over there. So, and this week we also want to, um, let me open that up. We, so, we also want to thank our, the artist, uh, Genevieve uh, Sims, to make the great poster for this week. And thank you everyone for coming and see you all next week. <laughs>